timely uh, moment, but it's also a discussion uh, that is really anchored in a wonderful piece of research uh, by Anand Krishnan, who's here with us today. Uh, Anand was a visiting fellow at uh, Brookings India and worked with us for over a year uh, and focused on a, a particular issue um, in his research paper, which we just launched uh, a few weeks back. Uh, that paper is available on our website, Brookings India. Do look at it. Uh, it's called Following the Money, China Inc.'s Growing Stake in India-China Relations. Um, and in that paper, which has been widely circulated and got a lot of attention over the last few weeks, uh, for obvious reasons we'll come to in a second, he really maps out the amount and also the direction of Chinese investments over the recent years in the Indian economy. Uh, he identifies a clear turning point in 2014. Uh, he maps out the amount uh, of the massive inflow in new sectors, including non-traditional sectors like tech, finance, energy, and um, has, and that for, therefore this given us in many ways, uh, uh, I think a lot of uh, material to discuss today. Uh, I'm joined by a wonderful set of panelists. What we try to do is have an India angle, an India-China angle, a China angle, but also comparative angle with what's happening around the world. Europe has faced very similar issues with an inflow of a lot of Chinese investments in new sectors. So I'm joined by a very interesting group of people who will help us make sense out of what has happened, um, out of the new FDI restrictions or the new FDI policy India has implemented uh, uh, recently uh, targeting in particular China or a set of countries, but in particular China. Um, I'm joined by Ambassador Shivshankar Menon. Uh, he's a distinguished fellow here at Brookings India in Delhi. He served as a national security advisor to the Prime Minister of India between 2010 and 2014. And before that as foreign secretary, as well as ambassador and high commissioner to China, Pakistan, Israel, and Sri Lanka. Ambassador Menon is the author of Choices Inside the Making of uh, um, Indian Foreign Policy, which was published in 2016. And he's about to come out with a new book called India and Asian Politics, um, Indian and Asian Geopolitics Past Presence, to be published uh, later this year by Brookings Press. Anand Krishnan, who I mentioned already, is a former visiting fellow at Brookings India, uh, where he joined us between 2018 and 19. Anand is presently a journalist with the reference newspaper The Hindu, based in Chennai. Uh, Anand has reported out of China for over a decade as a correspondent for the Hindu and also for the India Today group. His, re his reporting is focused on Chinese relations with India, China's neighborhood diplomacy, Chinese domestic politics, Tibet, and Xinjiang. Uh, out of Beijing, we are joined, and there's some technical problems. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Lu Yang joined us already. Hopefully, she will. Dr. Lu Yang is a research fellow at the Institute of the Belt and Road Initiative at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Dr. Lu received her PhD in political science from South Asia Institute at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And she's currently also a fellow at the India China Institute of the New School in New York. Uh, finally, uh, out of Berlin, uh, Dr. Janka Ertel is joining us. Uh, she's currently the director of the Asia program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. She holds a PhD from the University of Vienna in Germany and previously worked as a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Berlin and also as a director at the Kerber Foundation in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Ertel's work focuses on security in the Asia Pacific region, Chinese foreign policy, 5G and emerging technologies, and also EU-China relations with a transatlantic focus. So welcome all. Um, I think I can invite participants to submit a few questions over the next 40, 40 minutes uh, as we proceed with the discussion. You can share your questions on Zoom here, if you're joining us here, or on the YouTube comment box, and we'll select a few. And given time constraints, we'll try to uh, focus on some of those. Um, so I think I'll start with Anand. Uh, you're really the reason why, why we are here today, um, Anand. Um, you, you've uh, mapped this investment, these, this flow of investments coming in. You know, if you could briefly tell us what surprised you in your paper as you did this research. And also, I mean, coming to this current hot topic now, what do you think are the main drivers behind these new, this new FDI policy uh, of the Indian government? What are the pros? What are the cons? What is really driving this, uh, where is this coming from, this new policy, Anand? Thank you so much, Tino. Um, 
I think that one of the things that struck me was, I think it was very clear post 2014, 2015, you were seeing the peak of Chinese outbound investment, not just to India, but all over the world. And, and I think it's important for us to state here that what is coming to India is part of a broader trend. It's not that this is something that's unique or specific to China-India relations. So between 2013 and 2016, outward Chinese investment pretty much almost doubled from about 100 billion to close to $200 billion. India, frankly, is quite low on the list. I think it ranked 31st in the destinations of OD, Chinese ODI uh, between 2014 and 2018. But uh, having said that, you did see a huge amount of money coming into India, especially in the tech sector and in funding uh, startups. And you had big Chinese companies like Alibaba and Tencent drive that process. So I think there's a couple of interesting trends. Uh, the first, I think, is that up until 2014, the kind of investment you saw from China wasn't that diversified. You had stuff from the big uh, state-run companies, those working in infrastructure, construction. But this process is a lot more market-driven and you have a much more diversified set of players involved from tech companies. You still have state-owned companies as well, but you also have financial institutions, VC funds. So it's a much more diversified uh, set of actors that we're seeing. And what also struck me was this came at, at the very same time that India and China were trying to do more with their relationship. Uh, you had a huge bilateral trade deficit. They were trying to do things to boost investment. But I found it quite strange that, I, that it seemed to me that a lot of this was happening without either of the two governments actually designing it that way. It kind of happened to be very natural flow of investments. And I, do, I don't think it was part of what both sides intended, which is why I think you're now beginning to see uh, the Indian government trying to catch up in terms of regulation and trying to get, get a better handle of what exactly is happening. You mentioned the change in FTI rules. Quite frankly, I don't know uh, what triggered it is my honest answer. I don't know if it was a long thought out plan, which would strike me as strange because being in Beijing 2014 onwards, I saw the huge effort expended by the government of India in trying to get Chinese companies to come to India and invest. They did have a lot of hangups about coming to India. A lot of Chinese money was going to Southeast Asia, but this was around when Make in India was taking off as well. So to me, this new note kind of seems to go counter to those four or five years of what we saw India trying to do in China. And it could well be, I'm sure we'll come to this later in the discussion, could well, maybe perhaps it was the news that came out of the People's Bank of China increasing its stake uh, in HDFC by 0.3% to a little over 1%. Maybe that was a trigger because it got a lot of media attention. But that's something we could come to when we, when we discuss uh, the, the change in particular. Good. So um, there's three sort of players or possibilities here. There could be security interests, sort of governmental security interests about hostile opportunistic takeovers and also sort of even narrow security interests in terms of information, data, and certain critical sectors. There could be a protectionist impulse from lobbies in the Indian industry and big companies or small companies. And third, you could have also political argument, which we actually have seen over the last two weeks here in India about protectionism, nativism, and protect the Indian economy, don't get into FDAs, FDI investment is bad, et cetera. Do you have a sense of have these affected? I mean, is it is it is any of these really relevant, or is it still a black box and we have no idea? Frankly, for me, you know, it's I genuinely don't know what was the motivation for this change. It could well be that there were. It could well be that there was a concern at the money that was coming in to the tech sector, which kind of seemed, in my opinion, to bypass the attention that there was. We were focusing a lot on greenfield investments coming in from China which is the investments that India wanted uh, and which we weren't really getting in the kind of scale that we wanted. But while we were quoting greenfield investments, you had all this money flowing to startups. Perhaps this is a belated realization to that, but frankly, you know, I, I'm not privy to the, the decision-making that led to this much discussed press note number three. Thanks. So uh, Ambassador Menon, uh, if we may turn to you, uh, you come in with decades of experience uh, in the Indian government. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, and uh, this is really not a new trend. I mean, it's surprising, it's strong, it may be triggered by something. 
but this comes in line with, I think, interests or security or concerns about investment. Uh, I remember 15 years ago, seeing reports about Chinese investment in uh, port infrastructure in uh, India and the uh, concerns about that. If you could tell us a bit if this surprised you, but also if not, what has been the thinking in the past 10 years in India about foreign direct investments, if what the concerns are, what the screening mechanisms are uh, at hand for the Indian government to assess really the concerns about these investments? Well, I think, uh, thank you, Tino. And thank you, Anant, actually, for a really good paper because it's, it's raised, I think, all the right issues. And even though we are in a post-COVID world, it stood up very well, actually, your paper. And it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, I know no more than you do, or Anant. I've been out of government now six years, so I have no idea what triggered it or why this decision. But to me, it's, it's, it's been among the, the set of ideas that have been in the toolkit, which have been discussed in government for quite some time. It's not a brand new idea. I think the interesting thing for me is that it's been implemented now, that it's actually out as a press note from government. It's become government policy, declared policy. And to an extent, I think that is part of a general process of uh, within this government, certainly, uh, of disenchantment with free trade agreements and with open liberal you know, flows of capital, of goods, of trade. Uh, and uh, we saw it in the decision to walk away from the RCEP, for instance. Uh, so, and there is certainly a strong body of opinion saying at a time when the Indian economy is under stress, uh, this is not the time to open up and allow anybody to come and buy Indian companies, good value, but which may be very cheap at this time. Uh, but I think we have to wait and watch and see how this is implemented. Uh, within two days of the press note, there were stories obviously based on government sources saying Chinese investments will be fast tracked because it's, it's not as though India doesn't want Chinese investment. As Anant was saying, I think the, the government has always been keen on Chinese investment in manufacturing in India. There are certain things which government has uh, traditionally and certainly now considered sensitive, uh, critical infrastructure and so on. But at the same time, if you look at the, the reliance on China for telecom equipment, for power equipment, uh, for active pharma ingredients, for instance, for medicines, uh, for antibiotics and so on, semiconductor uh, conductors and other devices, uh, frankly, those that's very, very high already. So it's not as though this is somehow an attempt to exclude China. I think it's more probably an attempt to direct where Chinese investment goes and what it goes into. Uh, so I would see it in that light as part of a long process, which has a history at a time when the economy is under stress and there are increasing calls in India, uh, as you mentioned, to protect our own industry to develop when the world actually looks quite frightening to many people. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a natural attempt to try and, as I would say, direct Chinese investment into places where, you know, the government of India wants it to go. Uh, how successful it'll be, all that, how it'll be implemented, let's see. We, we so have to... Following on that, Ambassador Mandelman, how do you do that? The, the, the clarification mentioned only significant and sensitive investments will come under some scrutiny, right? Well, who decide what significant also, and sensitive? I think the background briefing made it clear they would be fast-tracked, which, uh, which again suggests that, you know, I think CII immediately after had said, you know, oh, this is a process that normally takes six months. They said, no, 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 it's not going to be like that at all. It's only for sensitive sectors. Now, that's a definition that, it depends on what you're looking at. You can look at criticality, you can look at uh, where and which functions you think are, which services of government, which functions in the country you must preserve for yourself. These are frankly, this is an ongoing discussion. It's not something that is you know, going to stay frozen or static. In some fields, 
like uh, cyber infrastructure, there is a definition in law of what is critical. Uh, in other areas, there isn't, frankly. Uh, we now are much more sensitive about uh, in, on security grounds. I think we're much tougher today than we were, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, and, and our definitions. And that's because we now know much more about these things and we have experience actually of, of suffering from laxness. So that's an open definition and that's something that I think will keep evolving. So that, I mean, Anand in his paper, for example, mentions that the data we have on Chinese investments is not reliable often in government or right. the routes are unclear. You saw the Hong Kong detail about citizens or not. You may, we were discussing today about third countries routing of investments. What can the government do to enhance its capacity to exactly yeah, I, check, I, monitor? I read that bit about you know beneficial control, significant beneficial. I read that as also covering investment through third countries, whether it's through Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on. But as I said, we have to see how it's actually implemented because most of the Chinese investment that we're talking about in fintech, in startups. Most of this has come from venture capital funds. Very little of it has come directly from China. Even the Chinese figures for direct investment are much lower than the figures that Anand's picture, paper has. I mean, it's somewhere in the region of six to $8 billion rather than 25, $26 billion, which is what we estimate as actually having come. I wouldn't say the government doesn't know exactly what's going on. I mean, government knows more than it lets on in public, I think in this case. So I'd, I'd be a little careful about assuming ignorance on the part of government about all the data. But that doesn't mean that they, you know, they don't write, they use that information and data differently from you and I maybe do. And they have a different imperative. So I, I wouldn't go that far as saying they don't know. And very briefly, before we come to Yang Lu, who joined us and with a good connection, it seems. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Lu. Uh, Ambassador Menon, uh, before we jump to, to, to China and to Beijing, are you afraid this will affect the relationship? I mean, this immediate, uh, ha have you seen the, the Chinese embassy statement, uh, the concerns expressed by the uh, 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 authorities in China? Is this a bad signal? Uh, you know, we're grown ups on both sides. We've handled a difficult relationship and a sensitive relationship to both sides. We've handled some very difficult, complicated issues like the boundary and so on. Uh, I mean, the Chinese embassy statement was a bit peculiar. It claimed it was against WTO. There's no WTO agreement on investments. I mean, there's nothing, there's a plurilateral negotiation going on on investments, which India is not part of where China is actually a party to, but WTO has no, no agreements, no, no stipulations on investments. So, so in that sense, I wasn't quite sure where that statement came from. I wouldn't, I'd, as I said, I would see how this is actually implemented and what effect it really has, which ones are sensitive, how much it's going to apply. Will it really delay the process? Does every application then need scrutiny? We'll have to see. And depending on that, yes, it could affect relations, but I don't think that you know, this in itself is, is such a big thing. Don't forget that on the Indian side also, there are issues which have been there for a long time, the trade deficit and so on. Maybe this will shake, shake it loose and start a real discussion between both sides about how to recalibrate the relationship. And maybe this is a good time when the world itself is changing, the world economy is changing, maybe this is a good time to do what the strategic economic dialogue is supposed to do. Thank you, Ambassador Menon. Uh, Dr. Lu, uh, welcome, uh, Yang, if I may. Uh, uh, and I, I think uh, what's really useful uh, uh, to have you here, it's wonderful you could join us, is to give us a bit of a sense here in, in, in India and around the world uh, about the importance of the economic relationship uh, or the economic dimension in India-China relations and whether this recent uh, particular uh, um, you know, new policy on FDI and how it has been received uh, over there in Beijing. How are companies and the government looking at this? Uh, how, will it, how may it affect uh, future investments uh, or the broader attractiveness of uh, the Indian market? 
Um, thank you, thank you, Constantino, for the invitation. I'm also uh, very happy to join the discussion. I think uh, Anand's paper is a very timely uh, paper, and especially under current circumstances, and we can have this kind of discussion and uh, in this manner. Um, first, uh, I quite agree with Anand's observation that he are, have two, mentioned two periods. One is the uh, periods before 2014 and one uh, period is after 2014. And indeed, in this period after 2014, we have seen a growing interest in India, uh, in China. Um, for example, uh, before 2000, uh, so especially in social media, um, before 2014, most uh, information provider um, on Indian, it uh, comes from journalists and scholars. But since 2014, we witnessed a, a booming of social media. So different kinds of uh, uh, reports on India. And there are two kinds of uh, writers joining these groups uh, to provide information on India. One is the practitioners uh, who are doing business in India, who set up uh, some, some agencies in India and to, to connect businessmen and Indian business community. And the second is some uh, like uh, independent writer. They, uh, they can open the social media account and they can uh, earn money from their writing. And they are very market sensitive uh, because they notice that India it's, uh, it can attract lots of attention. Therefore, uh, they write India, they just sit in their writing uh, the studio and write any uh, things that connected from the internet with lots of wrong informations and also produce this to attract attention. But this is a good sign that at least whether wrong information or, or the real information, this is uh, interest that, that from Chinese side. And I'm happy to see this kind of development, especially I'm also a scholar who works on Indian China relations for over 10 years. And uh, secondly, in Anand's paper, um, I would like um, most of the things I will, I'm very satisfied. Only one thing that the paper goes from a premise that, um, which is also normal, which is an argument. It's very popular in the United States, in the European context as well. It goes to the premise that Chinese private sector uh, connection with, uh, with the state um, and because of that, because Chinese government is authoritarian rule, is undemocratic, because of this kind of trust, uh, mistrust, therefore Chinese company, private sectors, companies in private sector is also not trustful. And this is why uh, the security issues comes in. Um, but I will say that um, we noticed this kind of um, connection between uh, Chinese private sector and Chinese state, but we have also to look at the conflict between these um, private sector and uh, state. And you just look at the ownership. One is SOEs and one is private sector. Private sector is market driven, uh, is profit driven. And uh, we have a long discussions uh, in China between the state and the private sector, because you know that in China, the environment, the business environment for the private sector is actually not very good. And China always, the government say market driven, uh, but sometimes it's difficult. Their space in Chinese markets was uh, limited. And this is why they go out to, to, to look for more profits. And this is why they, especially if we look at the Indian China's a business relationship after 2014, we noticed that it's uh, actually market driven, it's market led, it's not state led. And unlike the things happening in the pocket in Pakistan, in China Pakistan economic corridor, uh, we see it all government driven. Um, I also have some conversation with um, uh, colleagues from Pakistan. And they were really looking forward that Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, they can go to Pakistan, but actually uh, 
this is market driven and Chinese enterprise, a Chinese private sector would like to go to India. And because they see this kind of similarity and also I think why a, a tech, tech, uh, tech, uh, technology firms and uh, fintech uh, uh, like this kind of internet uh, finance is especially interest for uh, for Chinese investors because they see that the, the venture capital because they are very uh, profit driven and they also see these kind of stages of Indian development in the European markets or in the United States market, the consumers' uh, the habits, they are more established. And Chinese, uh, uh, in China, you, you see how, I just mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic and why China can have such a good control in these pandemic, because we are get used to the uh, cashless payment and these also, uh, reduce their chances of uh, uh, of people-to-people uh, -people contact. And this is why uh, Chinese uh, venture capitals and Chinese tech investors, they see this kind of opportunities in India because India, the markets, uh, they can produce these kind of opportunities for these uh, cashless payments like Alibaba in invest in Paytm. Uh, and, and these kind of things, and they, they also experience very similar development stages. And they also feel that a kind of connection because in China, this kind of opportunity is less, and, but India provides them this kind of opportunity. This is why, again, I will come to my next point. It's about how we look at security. I just want to compare Indian China's uh, development trace. And I give an example of Procter and Gamble is a consumer corporation of the United States. Previously, when I was a kid, I daily used um, the things that I daily use, like shower gate or shampoo. The mostly they produced by Pro Procter and Gamble (PNG), but uh, because these our our national brands um, were disappeared by the acquisition of PNG. But now you see that after 20 years and 30 years, our own Chinese brands coming up and I shifted for PNG product for own Chinese brands. This is why I would say that if you look at things in a five years term, 10 years term, or 20 or 30 years term, it is very different. We bring this kind of know-how and India's priority is development. And in China, if we do not have this kind of economic reform and do not welcome foreign investors, then China could not develop. Uh, maybe in five years or 10 years, there's lots of problems uh, because then you see that our own uh, enterprise, they were uh, take over by the others, but then they trained local workers. And after some time, they get this kind of knowledge, they get this kind of know-how, and they are seeds in the country. And this is why our industries can boom. And India needs a kind of labor-intensive industry and China's experience, uh, which uh, could be useful uh, for India. So um, this is uh, my points. Um, so I will uh, maybe so in the next round, Yes, we can discuss. Thank more. you, Jan. Uh, in particular, the point we had also discussed yesterday when we were speaking uh, that you were concerned that, you know, for the companies that are already invested in India, who know the market well, this may not be so concerning. But there's, an, there's a variety of other companies you were mentioning that are coming up, that are willing to invest in India, that will obviously be concerned about this new FDI policy and have questions that, therefore, that may reduce the attractiveness of the Indian market as an investment destination. Uh, uh, Yanka, um, if we may now move to Berlin. Uh, Yanka, you've done uh, amazing work in tracking the EU, Europe, China relationship uh, from a transatlantic perspective, from an EU perspective, from a bilateral country to country perspective, Germany in particular. Um, and you know, nothing of this we're debating here today is new to you. Uh, in many ways, the European debate on screening in Chinese investments uh, is new, but certainly new, uh, older than the, the uh, Indian debate, at least in the open uh, over the last two, three years now. Um, could you share a bit with us what, you know, 
the European experience has been in setting up an infrastructure or not. We know that there's a division. You wrote a piece in October in foreign policy actually calling out Germany is sort of like taking a different policy despite US and EU pressures. So if you could share a bit with us, us I think that would be very interesting to understand how India could, should, uh, or not approach this issue. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Anand, for a fantastic report. Um, I think the, the similarities in the debate are striking, and as I said earlier, I think it calls for a comparative debate about uh, you know, what, what can Europe and India learn from each other from respective experiences that they have made. In Europe, I mean, we've seen um, the big debate about uh, foreign investment from China started um, after the financial crisis with a lot of investments, especially in Southern Europe, um, where it was actually very much helpful for um, for pushing also German demands for um, you know, privatizing uh, certain sectors, for um, austerity measures that the Germans uh, inflicted upon their Southern European partners to get their finances in order. So Chinese investment in that regard really helped um, stabilizing some of the European economy and China's um, 2008-2009 policies of global stimulus measures, of kind of global investment measures were helpful for the global economy and, and helped us through uh, the financial crisis. So this were, is where this whole conversation started. Um, but then there was a growing wariness over the last few years about investment in certain sectors. And I think this is also where the, where the Indian debate is at the moment, basically say, well, not all the investment is the same kind of investment. And there is investment that we actually appreciate, but there is investment that makes us iffy. And to kind of put that iffiness in a certain shape, um, the Europeans started debating, well, what are the sectors that are really critical? What are the sectors that we need to be concerned about? And what are the dimensions that we need to start being worried about? Um, because as Anand, you also pointed out, you know, one has to not um, blow Chinese investments out of proportion. And also foreign direct investment is not the only category by which this is counted. You know, it's also research collaborations. It is influence in general. It's global standards setting. So FDI is just kind of a chunk or one slice of the debates that we need to, to look at, but it's still relevant. So what the Europeans have done, come up with at the moment is um, trying to find a sort of unified approach. That's very, very difficult because, um, and as, that's also something that I found quite striking as a similarity to the paper, when Anand, you mentioned that there is a need for a more coherent approach within India between the different actors. Well. On that front, the Europeans know that debate. Coherence is a huge problem for us, um, and everyone has their own little mechanism on this. And the problem in the investment screening sector is that it kind of cuts to the heart of what Europe is and what European countries are. Some of them are really, really open, really free trading economies. Think especially about the Nordic countries. Others have more protectionist tendencies, more state-led tendencies. Think more about the Southern European countries in general. So you have to bring together different sets of, of also kind of economic ideologies that are behind this. In, on the European level, there's no competency for the EU to kind of set rules in this regard. Mainly what they can do is basically provide suggestions. So what we have a, a certain, currently we have a, um, a situation where we have basically slightly more than half of the European countries of the EU member states have investment screening mechanisms, national mechanisms, and the other little less than a half doesn't have these mechanisms. Um, and, uh, and the EU can now provide uh, with a mechanism that has been decided on last year and will come into full effect by October this year, can now provide suggestions to the member states. So basically, if you have a national screening mechanism, you have to also notify the EU Commission that you are um, going to you know, pursue a case and going to look into a case. And if you don't have that mechanism, then other states um, that are concerned, other EU member states that are concerned about a certain investment can bring this to the EU. And, uh, and the EU can provide basically suggestions. This is, um, it seems to be a um, very loose mechanism. It doesn't seem to do much. And everyone was criticizing this as this is, well, what is it? It doesn't have any teeth it, it, it can't do anything. But in the end, if you have an investment um, that is scrutinized by um, you know, expertise on the EU level, where there's an assurance that this will be a speedy process within just a, you know, a matter of a month or a few weeks uh, that this can be taken care of, if you have a judgment that says, actually, you should be really worried about this investment, then it will be harder to go beyond that. In most of the cases, there will not be this judgment. Most of the investments will be fine, will probably not be under scrutiny. But in the few cases when there is an EU voting, basically an EU commission statement that says, I wouldn't do it if I were you, um, then you know it takes an extra amount of um, 
willingness to do this um, for a company and it goes into an extra risk. So I think we don't, shouldn't underestimate the effect that a mechanism like this, despite the fact that it doesn't have like an enforcement mechanism where the EU can say, no, you know, we veto, you cannot do this. Also, there are a number of other tools that the EU has in its toolkit um, where it has more competencies, for example, in competition law. And in, in the competition area, um, there is a lot more than the EU, that the EU can do. I don't want to make this too technical, but basically what the EU wants to do is enhance transparency of what is actually coming into the EU, um, avoid market distortions through um, investments that are you know, uh, backed up by state coffers where it kind of distorts the competition within the internal market, and kind of just be wary about where are sectors that we need to um, be mindful of. And I think in all of those categories, this is very similar to what, um, what the Indian concerns are. And, um, and, and I have been joking to add to one of the, you know, uh, Anna has made five excellent recommendations and I would add the six and say, talk to Europe because this is really something where you can say, you know, we don't want to create a Lex China. In Europe, we don't want to create that yet. We're grappling with comparable challenges. We have the coherence issues. Um, we have lots to learn from each other um, in the different approaches that are being taken. And, uh, and I think in Europe, we, we may have some regulatory experience to share um, that also kind of points to difficulties that could be there. And I think on, in the last point, this kind of cooperation can also boost resilience in general, because it may enhance also the cooperation between India and Europe. Um, and at, in this currently changing environment, as Mr. Menon was, was, was uh, kind of alluding to, with the countries in this very weird geopolitical context that we find ourselves in are striving for, is more internal resilience and more options. And I think between India and Europe, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Uh, Yanka, very briefly, uh, wonderful, but uh, two quick questions because these are areas you've worked on and you know particularly well. To what extent is there this argument? I mean, uh, uh, Yang alluded to it, that this is US pressure. And you mentioned in your article in your work too, uh, is it just a political American pressure often on the EU? One, second, distortion of markets may sound like also protectionism, right? I mean, the markets are in the, in the hands of an oligopoly often, of European big companies. They feel threatened by these Chinese companies. So these two sort of arguments, how do you see them? So one can definitely say, starting with the last one, that Europe is still the most open economy that you find on the globe. Um, so it is, um, it's a bit uh, weird to um, kind of think that the Europeans are so incredibly protectionist. There are certain sectors where Europeans are more protectionist than in others. But in general, Europe is a very, very open place and it wants to remain open. I think that's been like the line that you see from all of the um, people coming out of the commission, but also coming from the member states. Europe doesn't want to become a fortress. That's not the idea. Um, but the idea is that if you have a market that is very open compared to a, uh, another market that is not very open, um, then you create conditions under which your companies have to compete on an unfair, um, on an unfair scale. And that's the level something playing that, field. Exactly. The level playing field discussion is one that is quite dominant where you say, you know, if, if European companies do not get the same access to the Chinese market, then we need to discuss that at least. And we need to debate how we can level that better because it will create otherwise conditions in which um, Chinese companies being able to access a huge domestic market and can benefit from that and European companies not being able to, to do so. So I think the protectionist debate is not one that is kind of overshadowing that so much. I think this is, there are always elements in this um, where you know, that's what I meant in terms of the different ideologies behind this as well. There's just different thinking about how economies should run in Europe, but I think that shouldn't be um, over, overstated. On US pressure, um, so I, I think you're alluding to the 5G conversation, which uh, is one that was a heated debate all of last year and it's not over yet, um, which is also one thing that um, we, can, we can definitely say this has been dragging on for a long time because it's complicated. It's just not an easy call to make. One would say, one could say, this is a no brainer. Why are the Europeans discussing this at all? From the three leading companies in the sector, two are European, um, one is Chinese. Why not go for European technology? Well, because we have been very open uh, in the past a few decades, um, Huawei and ZTE have a huge market share in 3G, 4G infrastructure. Um, it, it has been a, a good partner for the European telecoms operators. And so it was very much invested in the existing infrastructure. Also, trade relations with China are super important, especially for Germany. So anything you do in that regard to upset A, the relationship, and B, change the kind of setting of the infrastructure has comes with a cost. So US pressure here um, 
was applied in kind of an across the board fashion on not only all of the European states, but all of the allies, frankly. Um, and it had different varying degree of effect. Um, in, in Eastern Europe, for example, in Poland or Romania, it was much more effective um, because there was a wariness about US security guarantees um, and a much lesser degree of dependence on China. In Germany, it was much less effective. And I think looking at this more in a nuanced way is what kind of brings us forward. This is a genuine European discussion. Now, it was triggered by US uh, pressure to some degree in the 5G sector. And I keep joking that uh, sometimes we should be thankful for that because this was an important discussion that needed to take place in Europe. But it's a European conversation now that is uh, you know, not affected. This is about European interest and not about US interest at this point. Thank you, Janka. Uh, Anand, uh, maybe over to you. Feel free to maybe respond to a few of the issues you thought of interest, feedback to your paper. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what Jan mentioned, the what you call blurred boundaries, I think, in your paper between uh, state-owned enterprises in China and the so-called private companies, uh, Chinese investing, who are investing in, 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 in India. Uh, is that a, if you could describe that a bit, but feel free to, to jump in on any of the issues you thought of interest. Yeah, I think that is a, that is in many ways the crux of the issue and the crux of the debate is how do we deal with the Chinese private sector? I think it's not a black and white answer. And I tried to hint at that in the paper that it is a blurry relationship. One may make the argument that this applies to, country, to companies in any country, but I think that we have to look at the fact that it is quite unique in China in terms of the space that the private sector and private companies operate. And Huawei is obviously the, the biggest example of that. For, I, for, for many years that I've been looking at Huawei, I can't for the life of me still give you a clear explanation about who owns Huawei, uh, given that it has such a difficult to understand ownership structure. And I've read various explanations trying to explain who owns Huawei. And it, there's, there's still lack of clarity on that. Even if Huawei is not a state company, you wonder sometimes the actions of the Chinese government, they treat Huawei as if it's clearly a, an asset of the state in many ways. And I think one clear example of that was just last week, there was a story of former Huawei employees were discussing on WeChat, the kind of, uh, kind of actions and plans, the businesses that in the Huawei was dealing with in Iran. And what happened was these former employees were actually arrested uh, for having this conversation on WeChat, discussing what Huawei is doing in Iran. And that was something done by the police in China, not even uh, because of Huawei wanted it to be done. So it's clearly a company that Ch China state it treats in a way that they think it has uh, benefits to the state. I think someone posed a question already that it's always puzzling that on the one hand, the Chinese government likes to stress that Huawei is a private company, but then on the other hand, you often hear the foreign ministry. It comes off. It comes up so often in foreign ministry briefings when when a country takes a decision against Huawei's interests, China speaks up for it. So the, I would respond to Luyang by saying that it is a blurry relationship at best. You only need to look at the kind of roles that the Chinese private sector is playing in China. The relationship, in terms, for example, even COVID-19 has brought to the fore in terms of data sharing. I think there are very few firewalls and checks and balances that offer protection for Chinese users and their privacy of data. And these are valid questions for us in India to think about and ponder. Perhaps in our rush to get investment from China, we haven't really given that that much attention. I think we are lagging behind what Yanka was talking about, this debate about how do we deal with Chinese companies. It's perhaps two, three years late in India, I think only because the Indian tech sector and startups have been so focused on getting capital from China that we really haven't engaged with this question hard enough. And my short answer is, I don't think it's black and white and, we'll, and it perhaps suits India to look at each sector, look at each investment before deciding how to deal with it. Thanks, Anand. I think uh, let's do a quick uh, round now. I'd really like to take this in terms of the India-China relationship in the context on which all of you have worked and also the Europe and how these relationships are being shaped not only by what we've seen so far, the rise of Chinese investments around the world, let's say a post-13-14 uh, phenomenon, but now on top of that, 
system, system, systemic change, maybe economic change. You have the COVID crisis and a whole debate going on, a whole, I'd say, recalibration of the global order. Let's see what's happening, but a lot of uncertainties. And then, very briefly for you, how do you see uh, the, uh, in this case of case of India, the FDI policy, but also uh, the COVID crisis affecting the India-China relationship? Is there a sense of trust? We've seen that both leaders have actually, I think, not spoken to each other directly, right? I think the Chinese president has spoken to the, to the uh, to Prime Minister Oli in Nepal, for example. Uh, the Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi, has spoken to several of the neighboring countries and other uh, leaders of, the, of uh, great powers around the world. What's happening? What do you expect to happen over there? Just this week, you know, we interviewed uh, the Indian ambassador in China, uh, Vikram Mistry, on this, on this question. And to me, it was quite striking that despite all the debate and backlash we're seeing in India and in the media, in the public sphere, the message uh, that he gave to us, and I think that we've seen from the government as well, is pretty much business as usual in terms of saying, well, you know, this is a complicated relationship. The elements of differences, there's elements of working together, that's not going to change. And one only need look at, for example, the, the dependence on China that we've had in the last few weeks in terms of importing so much of personal protective equipment from China, test kits from China, which right now are a matter of big debate in India in terms of their efficacy. But the message that I've been that I took away from, from, the, from the interview with Ambassador Mistry was it sounded so much to me like what we have been hearing in the past. And it seems to me that for now, at least, regardless of this huge change that we're seeing, they have to kind of ensure that there's some element of stability in the relationship and some element of continuity in what we had in the last few years. Why no call between both leaders or are we reading too much into that? Well, we did have, uh, I think we had a call uh, for external affairs minister Jayashankar did speak uh, to foreign minister Wang Yi. Uh, so there, it's not that there's uh, engagement has been cut off. And I think I would say, I think letters have been exchanged if I, if I read that somewhere between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi. So I wouldn't rule out a call in the near future. Ambassador Menon, I will ask you not to be very diplomatic in, the, in, this, in this answer, because we had that from Anand now, the good sort of feedback <laughs> and all of the well and will continue, which I sense is obviously, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the default approach. But we've seen calls from around the world, singling out China, expecting more from China, trust levels in China, you would agree with me. I don't know if they're the lowest, but they're lower than they were certainly three months ago. Uh, the Australians are pushing uh, for inquiries or requests to look into this. Uh, the WHO uh, conflict reflects again that the US pulling out. Uh, the Swedes today, I think, came out again, uh, one of the ministers in the Swedish cabinet uh, requesting also some type of an EU position to put in some pressure to look at this also from the you know, inquiry angle into what's happening in China. In India also, we've seen this in society, uh, on social media. I, I've not seen it in the last few years, maybe you've seen it, uh, I'm sure, in the, in the many other decades, but a certain distrust and animosity towards China. Do you think this will affect the India-China relationship? Well, I think you're right to the extent that, you know, I think Takshashila held a poll, snap sort of poll in the Indian public, and they saw that there was a slight diminution in the number of people who had a favorable, favorable opinion of China in the last three months, a slight drop. But more important than that, I think a lot of what we're seeing now is really noise. For me, every government, it doesn't matter where, India, Europe, China, America, they're, in, they're fighting for their survival. Most leaders are fighting to maintain their authority. They have no idea whether what they're doing is working. Everybody is declaring victory, but they're all trying to find somebody else to blame. And many of them face either an election or their own authorities in question. They don't know where they'll be six months from now, one year from now. This is a moment when governments are fighting, as I said, for their survival. And at that time, I don't think you should take the noise that they make about each other too seriously. If you're sensible, you will play politics. This is what it is. What we're watching is, is politics in high gear, domestic politics in very high gear. Watch it. 
but I don't think anybody will do anything irrevocable to affect the relationship. And I think that's what India and China are doing. They're doing business as usual. We're actually buying protective equipment. We're buying, you know, medicines, all kinds of things from China. We're continuing business. Six months from now, we'll be in a different position. Everybody's primary responsibility will be how to get their economies back up, how to repair the social fabric, whatever this crisis is, this health shock and the economic crash, because this is a crash. This is not just a recession or a depression and how to fix that. At that time, they'll all realize that they can't do it alone. They will need China, they will need the US, they will need everybody. So it seems to me that we shouldn't get carried away by the noise and the emotion at the height of the crisis. And what we're seeing now is a very high noise to signal ratio. And I wouldn't therefore draw huge conclusions about the future of the relationship based on what we see now. Now, it's true, politics can go terrible in many of these countries if the pandemic isn't handled, if the econ economic shock is not born, and the social fabric actually starts getting affected. In that case, yes, you have a longer term problem. But I don't think we're there yet. And today we can't say, none of us know where this is going to be six months from now, one year from now. Governments certainly don't know. So let's not ascribe you know, omniscience, omnipotence, and so on to ultimately a group of individuals, alpha males, most of them, who are in crisis. So assuming the US continues on this uh, trajectory, which is uh, declining well, with- election the coming. Hmm. So I, you know, let it happen. And then let's talk about this. So even if there is pressure from several countries, think India will continue on this, on this trajectory. Well, in any case, you know, ultimately, as I said, it, I don't know what India will do. I can only say what I think India should do. For me, the ultimate decider of what you do, you know, all these questions of, oh, is China culpable? Mustn't we investigate? I think anywhere there should be an investigation. I'm very surprised that China itself hasn't come forward and said, let's do a scientific objective investigation because any other attitude actually looks guilty. You know, so I would think there should be, but that's not assigning culpability. Yeah, that's not victor's justice. That's not trying to blame somebody. That's trying to see that we don't end up in this position again in the future. And that I think we can only do when we're calm, rational in the future. The Indian government, very simple. Their attitude to anything like this should be, does it actually contribute to the welfare of Indians? If it does, if anybody can prove to me that you know an investigation will help the welfare of Indians, okay, but I don't see those connections, frankly. Today, it's just politics, as I said, it's noise. Thank you, Ambassador Menon. Uh, Yang, uh, from uh, Beijing, how do you see this? Uh, do you agree with Ambassador Menon? Do you think that, I mean, from Chinese perspective, this may actually uh, affect the relationship with me. I'm talking now about the FDI uh, notice and uh, the, the, the FDI policy um, uh, coming out. Uh, if economics, assuming the economic relationship is, or the dimension of the, econo the dim economic dimension in the relationship with India is so important, right, for China. Um, Will this affect the relationship? Will there be some resentment or some uh, pushback from, from Beijing we can expect? Um, actually, I uh, quite uh, like um, Ambassador Manon's sober observation and his mood is positive. Um, I was also agreed with him that we are grown up and China-India relations have so many ups and downs uh, since the 1950s. And the leaders are mature. Um, I think the, the problem is that uh, for the uh, scholars or politicians who know the relations, they, are, they know how to deal with that. Um, and, uh, but for the uh, investors are, um, who do not know India very well, they will easily get this kind of information and will be easily affected. Um, I think the uh, COVID-19 will really change a lot. Um, also in Chinese investment, because now the governments are, they do not have money um, this is, uh, it seems that the effects 
it's long term. And how to deal with that? There's a developing countries, uh, they will have uh, debt problems. And IMF have already started to discuss these issues. And also China, we are under extremely uh, pressure of economic uh, issues um, for the employment. And you know that we have two goals these years. First is to reach Xiao Kang, and secondly is to, to bring up peoples from the poverty. And 2020 is the goal that she sets for China, but the COVID-19 comes and it seems uh, uh, to realize it, uh, it's difficult, although he emphasized in a recent uh, conference uh, that we still can, can make it. So that, but and anyway, it means that the governments do not have so much money and also these affect Chinese private sector heavily. Um, I will say that um, um, four people who are interested in invest India, but if they were have this kind of new regulations, they will think about other ways. And this is why I'm quite worried. But I think uh, we have the doctrine crisis, for example, in uh, and they, they also uh, threatens lots of Chinese uh, investment. But then after some times uh, it uh, recovered. For example, the uh, industrial park in Gujarat, uh, it was suspended. And now uh, recently in last year, it was renewed the Gujarat industrial park in, uh, in India. So I have confidence uh, in Indian-China relations because uh, I see uh, lots of positive trends uh, between youth in China and India. And there's a growing interest from both sides and they do not have much historical burdens. I think with the engagements between Indians and Chinese in future, although there is a lots of problems, we have difficult issues in the past, and economic relations actually um, uh, do not have so much historical burdens. And this is something that we should really uh, focus and um, to, to push. Because for example, there's not so many Chinese students in India now, but there's so many Chinese, uh, in Chinese go to India doing business and they bring the fresh ideas, fresh experience on India. And I hope uh, after the COVID-19 crisis, there's a, although there's a lots of noises currently, but they will also give some time for us to rethink the whole structure, the, the whole order. And I think um, and people uh, will get used to it. They would uh, become more mature about the relationship between India and China. And with the time we would develop our independent understanding about each other. So far, these kind of independent understandings still very limited. For example, Chinese do not understand very much about Indians uh, political system. This is why they feel that this kind of noises in Indians discussion disturbs them a lot. Um, and also uh, for Indians, it's difficult to understand their political systems, uh, for Chinese, how Chinese political systems work. So I would suggest that maybe we do not look at so much on ideological burdens, but look at the development issues and look at on the government's issues. And maybe we can find a better discourse to engage with each other. And I think, um, and on the other issue that uh, we have also experienced from Europe, but China, Indian's development, development stage is different from the European's development stage. And I think Indians has already a quite good regular, regulatory uh, systems in terms of lawmaking, and it's better than China. So I think actually I, I'm quite positive about how Indians handling this. And I always said that security is a kind of risk, but risk implies opportunities in China as well. If you said, I don't want any risks, 
that means you also block opportunities. So this is why I would say that really think about these kind of uh, uh, policy making and have more discussion in India uh, towards whether it should trade Chinese investment as it trades to as it trades Pakistan. Thank you, uh, Yang. Uh, Yanka, shall we come to you and how you see this affecting not the India-China relationship, but how do you see the COVID crisis uh, on top of the already investment problems and discussions you were identifying before? Uh, will that, uh, and again, I, I mentioned, um, you've seen in Europe these days, the responses and the hostility from the public mostly, but the Swedish government, I mean, Swedish cabinet minister, for example, today coming out and uh, here, not, here and there, a few other countries also expressing at the official level their concerns. Um, do you see this affecting the Europe slash EU China relationship in future? Yeah, I think uh, we, we've gone through these cycles, uh, as, as someone has mentioned to say, uh, you know, COVID-19 changes everything. And then it was COVID-19 changes nothing. And now it is, well, we really don't know what it changes yet. But what we can safely establish is that it will make a lot of things worse. And uh, we have a couple of fault lines that are already existing um, in the Europe-China relationship. And these will likely become exacerbated. We have a couple of fault lines within Europe when it comes to China, and those will likely become more pronounced. So these are the trends that we see. COVID-19 basically serves as a catalyst, one could say, to make these, to enhance these. And it will be the job of European policymakers to see how they can rein that in, how they can rein these tendencies in that we already see emerging. So what we have what we've experienced in Europe was a very unfortunate situation um, in the early stages of the crisis that Italy, on top of being ha having been hit really hard by the financial crisis and just recovering from that, was also then on top of that hit really hard um, by the by the COVID by the coronavirus. Uh, and we have seen a response on the EU side that was too slow and not in solidarity um, in the very early days. Now this has changed as well, but the optics of this in the very beginning were awful. Um, and in these optics, we saw Chinese planes arriving and Chinese doctors arriving, and Chinese masks arriving. And obviously that had done, that, that did something to the narrative. And um, this has provided China with a moment, I would say of geopolitical strategic opportunity where you, no one is even looking to the United States for leadership in this crisis. I mean, we, we're trying to look away at the moment actually. Um, and, uh, and this would actually have been a good moment um, for China to present openness, transparency, support. And that's why I agree very much with, uh, with Ambassador Menon. Um, there is this noise going on, but in this noise, you can see a couple of roads taken. Taken. And one of them is that China has chosen not to push for an international investigation immediately, which I think, I agree with you, um, it would have been very much in China's interest to do so, and to do so in cooperation with, with the rest of the world to really figure out what this is about to avoid a future crisis, uh, and to be transparent about what is going on, and also to not try to, you know, when Europe this was an often cited example, but the Europeans were asked by the Chinese leadership when they were providing aid in the early stages of the coronavirus crisis to China to do so with, you know, low key to not, you know, enhance the problems that are on the ground. Um, and when the opposite happened and China provided aid um, to the Europeans, then it, this was done with a lot of fanfare. And you wonder how that is, you know, going to affect the long-term relations between governments. And I, what we're seeing already is that. Um, the mood is shifting. Um, and one can say that, you know, the, the trajectory of Europe-China relations wasn't so great in 2019 already. It was the definition of systemic rivalry and there was a lot of concern. Um, and it hasn't gotten better now. Um, the, the trajectory is likely to get a little worse because the level of trust is even lower now. Um, and a lot of the governments are uh, worried about what this will do to their overall relationship. On the other hand, I agree with Ambassador Menon that in the aftermath of this crisis, it's going to be economic survival um, in the aftermath of the health emergency. And this is where the China factor will come in. So you can basically see two scenarios emerging. One, um, the countries that say, okay, economic uh, recovery first, um, embrace the opportunity that China proposes, whatever the conditions are, or to say, well, this has really, um, you know, this has taught us what China really is. This was one of the discussions or the masks are off was one of the debates sure. that we had. Um, and, and this is the new China that we have to deal with. And you will see both of those discussions probably simultaneously going on in Europe over the next few months 
And it's really too early to say where we will come out of this, but it will become more problematic and it will pair on the European Union um, and European Union cohesion. And actually, I mean, these, these two schools of thought, uh, we've heard them before, as you know, like so the imperative of contingency uh, in Greece, right, in Southern European countries, the Italians, we need to develop, we are structurally inept, we have to accept this money and we'll look into it later. And more powerful, there's, I think, a correlation there, more steady economies in the North, uh, Germany in particular, of course, or France sometimes taking a stronger position, a more a long-term principle position and saying we cannot afford to this, we cannot afford this, we have to be stronger. So we have, we have a few, oh, just, a, just a quick remark in that. We have a little bit of an issue though with what is going on in the wake of this. What is happening simultaneously where we have the lack of bandwidth at the moment to take care of? So I, I say we still have to focus on you know, tax standards. These are still things that we need to take care of. Um, there are still a number of security issues that we still have to um, focus on. And at the moment, European governments do lack bandwidth due to the you know, enormous crisis that they're in. And it will take a lot of cooperation to not let those drop um, because these are also areas in which the interest is high. Everyone, uh, every government lacks bandwidth. Fortunately, our connection has been good. We had good bandwidth here today. But we're joined by, uh, I think, 250 people at some point, both here and on YouTube, uh, who've uh, been uh, watching us silently, but they have some uh, very good questions. Many of them have come in. Uh, my colleagues sent me a few in a particular order. I'll just follow. And no, no, in no particular order, I'll just follow. So very briefly, if you'd give me another 15 minutes, we could end this with a bit of a more focused uh, Q&A session. Um, Ambassador Menon, uh, you come in first here. We have a qu two quick questions for you. One from Bipul Chatterjee from Cuts uh, here in Jaipur in India. Uh, he asks, do you think that China will get market economy status as per its protocol of accession to the WTO? That's the first question. The second question for you comes from Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Bahadur. He's at uh, a Center for Air Power Studies here in Delhi. He asks, how is 1% Chinese share in HDFC bad when 10% Facebook buy in Reliance Geo is equally bad, if not worse? Can't the government of India have a golden share in all important entities to safeguard its interests or in its uh, sectors? That's uh, for you. Maybe we can start with you, Ambassador Men, then I'll come to the other speakers. Thank you. Uh, about uh, market economy status for China, you know, that's got so tied up in the politics of it that I don't see that in today's situation, where if you look at China-US relations are much more contentious than they've been for 40 years, uh, where, you know, nobody's quite sure where the market is going, where the world economy is going. Everybody's fighting actually economic claims in their own countries. I don't see how market economy status for China is likely in the near future. Not in this situation. It would need a much more settled and calm. In any case, uh, I think WTO's future itself is up for, well, discussion at least. Uh, and I don't think we're going to see the kind of WTO we've had, we had in the past. All that was originally conceived and that everybody agreed to. So, I, that question, I think I'll, I'd say no, is my short answer. To Air Vice Marshal Bahadur about uh, the 1% share, the 10% share, uh, I don't think this particular PN3, this press note, is because of the 1% share. Because I mean, China, the, there was already a Chinese stake in HDFC before this. It's just, you know, raised by a tiny amount to get it to 1%. So I wouldn't link it. The idea of a golden share for the government has been under discussion, has been opposed vehemently by Indian business. I mean, it's, some, it's an old idea. We've talked about it for over 20 years. But if you ask CII, FICI, all of them actually feel that's a terrible idea. Because naturally, they're in this to make money. They're not here to guarantee national security or to take care of government's interest. And they don't see no reason to trust government with a golden share in companies that they feel they have built up themselves. So it's an idea, it's, it sounds good to government, certainly it sounds very good, uh, but much less so to everybody else. And there again, I would think it's unlikely for the time being. But Ambassador Menon, let me follow up on this last very interesting point. How do you in government try to extend the horizon of a profit-making institution in India? The profit-making institution, a company wants to make 
big bucks as quick as possible, right? The government of India has a long-term strategic interest that the economy remains strong, autonomous, that centers of strategic decision-making, a very European exp <laughs> expression, Correct. remain in the territory of the Republic of India. What and you've, you've been in touch uh, on many of these companies, I'm sure, when you're in government. How, how do you interact with them? I mean, it must be very the difficult. Way, right? The only way, the best way that works is to convince them they'll make even more money in the longer term if they do what you want them to do. But you have to be able to make a credible argument. And not all of them are in business just for today or tomorrow. And it's an interesting problem, actually, because family-owned firms, even though you know we don't like them, we keep saying you need to be public and so on, family-owned firms are much more responsive to these arguments in practice. Uh, <clears throat> which is why, as the nature of the Indian economy has changed, if you look at the, the, the firms that constitute the BSE index, for instance, I mean, that's changed. The proportion of family-owned firms has actually shrunk. So short-term maximizing behavior has actually increased in the recent past. So it's, you're absolutely right. This is a big issue. And it's, it's something that there's no simple one-shot solution to. I, I think, you know, you have to work, work the room and that's, that's the only way to do it. And ultimately, it has to be their self-interest has to kick in. Uh, and, you know, they're not interested in seeing the sector wiped out and seeing, you know, in losing all. They, they after all, they do have a, they do, but it might not be at the forefront of their calculus when they have to guarantee share value today or every quarter. And that, I think, is, is the trouble really for, for government when talking to them, because government doesn't think like that and finds it very hard to actually explain these reasons to them. Coming to uh, governmental capacity, Anand, a uh, question for you. When we talked about bandwidth, capacity in government, <laughs> institutions, expertise, uh, difficulties in addressing new challenges in economic, more complex economic uh, uh, um, uh, sectors, I mean, fintech, technology, right? Sectors that, you know, were not existent often 10, 20 years ago, and now the government in many ways is struggling to regulate them, protect them, address them. The question for you comes from uh, Simon Horenberger at the Embassy of France uh, here in Delhi. Uh, he asks that in your report, you mentioned that there are only three officials at the economic section of the Indian Embassy in China. Uh, and he speaks about, and he asks, you know, to what extent is there capacity in the government to assess what's happening in China and economics and the market of China? I mean, Yang had mentioned this too. Uh, do, you, do, you think, do you see this as limiting uh, the decision-making in, in, in the Indian government uh, as we uh, go along? Well, you know, I made that observation in the context of our need to engage with new players in China, specifically the private sector in China. And the kind of curious fact that we are one of few countries that doesn't have any chamber of commerce type of organization in Beijing. And in my conversations uh, with people in Beijing, whether it was people from uh, Chinese companies or even Indian companies, there is an issue there in terms of how are we going to engage with these people? What resources do they have to turn to if they want to figure out how to navigate things in India? I mean, it is a capacity problem. And so ultimately, it, it falls to officials in the embassy to deal with it. And that's not their area of expertise, uh, frankly. And uh, so I, it's, it puzzles me that we haven't really, I think India Inc. has to take up the responsibility. And, and I, over the last 10 years of being in Beijing, I have, there is a trend where people are interested in China in making a buck off of China, but perhaps not in a long-term plan of trying to understand the place and engage with the place. So. We have a lot to learn from uh, America, Canada, and Europe in this front in terms of the uh, resources they put into. Uh, if you just take one example of pharmaceuticals, where we have been complaining for the longest time with good reason that we have market access issues in China, which is a reality. But there is also the problem of us not engaging with the market in the way other pharma, our pharma companies do. We, our companies don't have lawyers, don't have people who go to the hospitals and deal with Chinese hospitals where most of the decisions are made. So we do have a huge capacity problem, which is what I was trying to bring out in the report. And as the nature of Chinese investment in, 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 that comes to India changes, when it's no longer government actors that you're dealing with, 
I think we have to look at that and figure out a better way of dealing with these new players. Thank you, Anand. Uh, Yanka, we have a question for you, which is from someone anonymous, and you'll understand in a second why. Um, everyone in India is asking, uh, how will this affect um, China? Not so much what we discussed today, Chinese investments coming to India, but foreign investments in China and being diverted to other markets. So I think there's a great hope, if I may say, or interest and hope at this point that some of the, say, Japanese investments, American investments that are going to um, China or were planned uh, for China will be diverted and end up here in India. Let's see about that. But the question is, are EU companies planning to exit from China? Uh, and will they, uh, like Japan and Korea sometimes, but will they, is there an interest there in the Indian market, an opportunity? So I think that's not a question one has to ask anonymously. I think that's a just very fair question of uh, the moment, um, of what are the what are the uh, what are the trend lines that we're seeing. So what we can definitely say is that there is no declared intent of European businesses to leave China now. They're not all going running um, from the Chinese market, especially not German companies because they have they've doubled down on China over the past couple of years. It's so important for them um, as a business partner, as a trade partner. Um, but what we are having is a discussion about diversification of risks and diversification of supply chains. And I think that's a discussion that has started before the coronavirus, and it has been enhanced gravely by the coronavirus. I think it's what we're seeing in the health sector that has become, you know, it has ad been added to this question of st strategic infrastructure and critical infrastructure and critical sectors, biotech, medical technologies, and just medical supplies. Um, we will see a diversification in that realm, definitely. And so the question is where to diversify to. Um, a lot of this will be within Asia, definitely, because it just makes sense also in the technology sector. Um, but it would also mean um, what are the costs? You know, Maybe the cost risk assessment has changed a little bit due to the crisis. And so sometimes onshoring some of the capabilities in terms of that new cost risk analysis can make sense. But what we will not see, um, and I think that's that's part of the noise debate that we've been having, um, you know, even here in Germany, there was this huge debate about all of the mask industry, all of personal protective equipment now has to be produced in Germany. Now I want to see how that is going to be economically viable and, and smart. I think that we have to diversify from a single source to a more diversified set of, of sources and that the Indian market and Indian players can come in very big here. Um, from, from that perspective, that's for sure. Um, but I don't think that everything will be sourced locally um, in the future. We will, Europe has a great interest in a globalized economy and, and maybe we have just been invested a little bit too strong, a little bit too dependent on China in that regard. And, and India can benefit from a, from a reshift and, and a rebalancing, recalibration of those relations for sure. The question is how this all ends. And I, I think that crystal ball, I don't have it. Um, I would make millions if I had it, but I don't have it. Uh, you will. I'm sure you will at some point, Yanka. <laughs> um, but uh, I think what you're saying is uh, very interesting because that's that, that, that word you use, diversification, is something that rings a bell here in Delhi, I'm sure with Ambassador Menon and many people who have practiced foreign affairs and strategy in India. Uh, the interest in a more sort of uh, variety of pots and baskets where you can diversify your risk coming to another word which Yang had mentioned earlier. Uh, and I, I just remembered of, uh, just pre-COVID, we had this uh, EU connectivity strategy being announced, right? And it was uh, Prime Minister Abe from Japan who was there present and Japan was sort of the, the uh, guest uh, country. But there was also tremendous interest over the last six months from the EU uh, to develop a connectivity approach to India, which basically means blended finance investment in infrastructure here uh, in India. So I, I, we, we certainly hear this and I think uh, many uh, people in the business sector here in India hope for that also. Uh, Yang, two questions for you in specific have come in or have been selected by, by my colleagues. Um, they're tough questions. Feel free to address them or not or take uh, this in any direction you wish. Uh, Sriparna Patak, who I think is a, a professor at Jindal University, if I'm not mistaken, here in India, she asks, what is the exact linkage between Huawei and the Chinese government? This is something Anand had, had mentioned here before. Uh, or if you want, between the private sector companies and the government. I mean, if you could address that a bit in detail. Uh, the second question which comes from you uh, from uh, uh, South India, uh, Sudarshan Ramachandran, I think for Chennai, uh, who teaches there at the university too. He's asking, will the upcoming National People's Congress in China change the political dynamics in Beijing? For the first time, are we witnessing some domestic turbulence or 
is in many ways Xi Jinping under pressure? Uh, is Chinese civil society asking questions about the virus? So up to you. Okay, um, so I don't think it's so so challenging the, the two questions. I will answer the uh, first questions. Um, I would say now, if we look at the private sector, um, people all look at BAT, no, Huawei, and they attract so much attention, um, both domestically and abroad. Um, but you know, these are the first ranking. Uh, there's lots of private uh, companies, private sectors are, they're looking for opportunities uh, in, in Indian markets, uh, but they are, they are separate group. I, I talk with, actually I was last year in summer in, 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 uh, in India, and for these groups, that second ranking or even lower ranking uh, Chinese uh, investors, uh, they say that Huawei and BRT, they are they do not interact with them because they are they are much they are the global they are their international corporation they have their own logic they have their own way of doing business, and um, and I would say that how uh, Huawei is linked uh, with uh, these um, uh, these uh, uh, with the states, I would just. Uh, uh, I was uh, quite away with Yanka's uh, uh, observation that uh, just these COVID crises uh, make us rethinking or uh, to, to diversify the supply chain, and uh, and these uh, kind of diversification is very important. But the time is all products, all components and parts produced in one country. This time is over. And I we will think about another kinds of globalization, and not another kind, but it, the globalization under more scrutiny, and we mean that division of labors and cooperations as in more important. And just give an example of how Chinese private sectors work. Do you really think a Chinese private sector, Chinese enterprise, are they are they? They are small, small. Uh, I also talk with somebody. They uh, they set up their business outside. They all produce. Uh, work, um, they all produce in other countries in Europe or in Asia, but they do not produce in China. And they make excellent work because, like, they know uh, this this kind of small and medium enterprises. They are uh, they know the know how are in in Europe is quite developed. This is why they they work so very specific components and they set up only their factories in Europe but they are Chinese private sector companies so this is why I would say that do not always look at Huawei and you know that Chinese um, Chinese um, uh, Chinese business sector they have to strive for their resources and any connection with the government is also good to enhance their position to get more resources uh, in China. And I think this is also normal uh, for other private sectors, uh, for, uh, private sector companies in other countries, they will also have more or less uh, um, um, linkages with the government. But the things that I will look at the ownership of and the, and the, and the difference between SOEs and private sector companies. And second questions, I think um, the, the COVID-19 crisis indeed uh, causes lots of discussions uh, uh, within China, especially at the beginning uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the crisis outbreak in, in Wuhan and, and the government do not react timely. And, but these things, I think uh, you can also observe in other countries that sometimes government just uh, want to find somebody or to cover something or to blame because they they are uh, they are they have fear of this uh, uh, this instability especially in China stability of the society puts uh, has a great value. Um, but uh, we were also rethinking about the government's issues. But I don't think that these will shake the whole political arena uh, currently. And uh, communist parties, uh, 
they are they have the legitimacy because uh, you say that uh, your your questions uh, I know people would like to questions uh, the uh, the party but the thing that um, it gets support of the most people and we see this kind of uh, development in uh, the past four decades and people just think about what we can do better but maybe not in a radical way and i think we need some time um we have also uh, lots of internal discussions on how we can deal with the crisis and the transparency is especially important if we look at the whole things in process and we talk about process and we say that we are very good uh, in practicing in doing practice in, in develop some new practice but we are still not uh, so well in developing some uh, series in doing this but for chinese uh, current society for the governments we need some uh, uh, some theories so it can guide our future development, especially on governments, which can make the society or more, uh, the whole decision making process more transparent and more trustful for the people. But I don't think it will happen in one year or two years and it will need to take time. And we also need to communicate with the others. And this, uh, uh, these uh, starts when we uh, use English to talk about it and more and more Chinese uh, young people engage on that and they use all kinds of platforms. Um, so I have confidence in future. Wonderful. On that uh, very positive note, uh, uh, Yang, um, uh, I think uh, it validates also the point Anand was making about the need to understand uh, the complexity of China, uh, right? Just because certain political systems are more centralized than others doesn't mean that there are tremendous debates, questions, and processes that happen. Uh, and I think in India, we uh, benefit from our knowledge about China. Uh, we benefit from uh, your intervention. And in particular, let me Thank Anand. I think he just ran to get his charger uh, in two minutes. He said his battery is running low. But uh, well, let me I, let let me let yeah, Yang, please. Um, I, maybe I just add to some comments uh, on on some issues that Anand raised. Yeah, very very about, about, yeah, We need to add some. Um, he talked about issues that Indian embassy do not have enough. Um, supports in doing business uh, in China uh, because the lack of uh, people who can who can give this kind of support and I think uh, these uh, is, is special is also the same in Chinese sides because we have limited uh, um, positions uh, for people who works in the embassy and how these how, how we can deal with issues uh, maybe we could not only depends on the governments. So maybe we can develop, at least from Indian Chinese, from the civil society, we can develop some kinds of mechanism to deal with this issue. Either help Chinese investors in India or Indians uh, on helping Indian investors in China. Thank you, Yang. So I, uh, Anand, you just went to run and get your charger. So you're in time for the, the thanks. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would like to just uh, quickly thank, I think uh, this is the first webinar we did at Brookings India now. So thanks to the wonderful team at Brookings India that put this together. It's not easy, a lot of tests. Uh, everyone seems to be doing web webinars now, but this was our first, it went well, uh, I think. Uh, so thank you to, to Zara, uh, uh, Kazmi, Nitika Nayar, and the whole team uh, that um, uh, worked hard on this. Thank you to all for joining. Again, we had uh, close to 300, 200, 300 people joining us uh, from many countries. Uh, I think a very useful debate and hopefully for all who attended, uh, they'll take something home. Uh, thank you to all you panelists who joined us here. Ambassador Menon, it's wonderful to have your support at Brookings India and your insights uh, from a governmental perspective and your experience, but also from your now post-governmental uh, scholarly, and I think always very insightful uh, and deep uh, perspective on what's happening on the India-China front. 
Uh, thank you, Yang, for joining us all the way from uh, Beijing. It's, uh, like you mentioned, very important for us to understand uh, how you over there look here in India. Um, and I think your last comment was really uh, on the point in terms of saying that both countries need to invest uh, in the knowledge they have about each other. Uh, because without knowledge, you'll go for the simple one-liners and the politics and the noise, which Ambassador Men had mentioned before, that is often detrimental to a stable productive, cooperative relationship, whatever relationship that is. Uh, uh, Janka, wonderful uh, for you to join us from Berlin. Uh, you are still in your early afternoon, I think. Um, but um, thank you because I think, again, this is a debate we've seen play out in Australia. We've seen this debate playing out in the US, in Canada, uh, in many other countries. But, uh, you know, the EU is always in my heart. And I think it's important that, like you just said uh, earlier on, the EU and India actually share much more than they think often. And fortunately, the last two years, we've seen this convergence happening. Uh, unfortunately, in this aspect, it's because of China and the common concern about certain Chinese investments. But there's a whole other productive, positive agenda, which I think animates the EU-India relationship and needs more of your perspectives and of uh, fellow Europeanists uh, here in India. Uh, most importantly, I think we all need to thank Anand. Uh, Anand did a fabulous paper, which is why we are here. Um, you know, there, we, we like to do events often at Brookings, but we have sort of a golden rule, which is, has its exceptions, but we like to do events that are around a piece of scholarship, a piece of research. Uh, that's why we like to launch the product first, the research gives scholars the time, and then have the debates and the discussions informed by that empirical evidence. Uh, there's a wealth of evidence in your paper, Anand. Uh, it speaks to your 10 years plus of deep work on China and in China, most importantly. Uh, so thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, I know you speak for yourself. It's not an institutional report. It's your report, but it brought, I think, this debate to Brookings India and here to India in general about the importance of tracking Chinese investments and the larger economic dimension in India-China relations. So on that note, I'll thank you all and uh, 